shift, please? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm going to have a hard time making across the country in first gear. Good morning. I am on my way to the airport, flying from Boston all the way to Vegas to pick this vehicle up. I've been looking for one of these for months now, and when I saw this one pop up, I couldn't help myself. I just had to place a bid on it. When I arrived at the auction house, my first task was to locate the vehicle in the yard. All right. As I give the car a once over, it's a little worrying that it has the word tow written on it. Here. Start right up. Uh -huh. Now do a wheelie. <laughs> So here it is, a 2010 Mercedes ML350 Blue Tech. Now, why did I come all the way across the country to Vegas to get this vehicle? Well, number one, it's a very rare spec, and I'll get to that later. And number two, it has all the good signs of being well taken care of. It has a matching set of Michelins, it came with two keys, and cosmetically, it seems like it's in pretty good condition. Now, I think these M-Classes are very underrated, which is why I was able to pick this thing up for only $4,000. The looks, they're very love it or hate it. I personally kind of like it, and they're reliable. They have good engines, good transmissions, they're well built because they're Mercedes, and they don't have air suspension, which a lot of SUVs do have. They're also easy to work on. This M-Class platform was built to fit a 5.5 liter V8 under the hood, and when you buy one with a V6, there's tons of room to work in the engine compartment. Now this one has the diesel V6. If you buy the gasoline V6, it's a lot more common in the US, and it's probably an even better choice for reliability. What makes this particular vehicle so special? Well, to start, the color is called Barolo Red, and it's so rare that I don't ever remember seeing another like it. Pretty much all of these M-Classes are black, white, or silver. Second, most M-Classes are surprisingly basic in the options department, but this one is almost fully loaded, making it very special. It has the Premium 2 package, giving it keyless go and a Harman Kardon sound system. It has the lighting package, giving it xenon headlights and LED taillights. It has brushed aluminum running boards, a trailer hitch, and it also has the Parktronic parking sensor option, which is surprisingly uncommon for an SUV of this era. Start it up. I mean, it sounds like it runs pretty well, and the only problem is that the check engine light is on, so I'm gonna have to diagnose that. So it says it is charge air cooler, temperature sensor, circuit high, bank one. Let's just erase these codes and see what happens. Yes. Well, I managed to find a workshop right here in Vegas where I can do an oil change on this thing and give it a once over before it's trip across the country. And this is the owner of said workshop. This is Justin from the fabrication series. Howdy. And that's his Viper that he picked me up in from the airport. While I don't have access to a lift, I do have access to a clean concrete floor, and boy is that a luxury. Well, it still has the front underbelly tray and the rear one as well, so that means it was serviced by people who actually care enough to put them back on. Or maybe it wasn't serviced at all. Yep, just looks like diesel oil. I don't see any crap in it. Okay, so I picked up some of this here oil, which I've heard is a good quality oil. I had it shipped to Amazon Locker because I'm not flying across the country with this. And specifically, it meets Mercedes-Benz approval 229.52, which is really important. And you can't get this stuff in any stores. That's a good start. Decided to take a look at the air filter here and holy guacamole, look at the insects in this. Have you ever seen this many bees in one place? All right, O'Reilly's had some of these air filters in stock. So 
sounds great. After the oil change and air filter replacement, it was time to hit the road and start my 2700 mile journey home. Unfortunately, when I got to the mountains, I discovered that the vehicle had a serious problem. Okay, sit rep. I've been driving the vehicle for a little while now, and for the most part, it's going quite well. The steering and suspension in particular feels really good. The vehicle is in alignment as far as I can tell. It actually is a lot more comfortable than I expected as well. The problem, however, is that when I'm going up hills, it doesn't seem to have any power. For example, my cruise control was set to 67 miles per hour going up a hill, and the speed went all the way down to 55 miles per hour, 12 miles per hour less than the cruise control was set, which tells me that probably I think the fuel filter is clogged. That's really not good for me to be driving this across the country in that condition, so I think I'm going to try to find a fuel filter. Unfortunately, this engine is not that common, and it's not very easy to find ones. So I might have to try the Mercedes dealer. Okay, it's the next day. I'm at the Mercedes dealer. I'm wondering how much is it going to cost for one of these fuel filters, and also I thought it was kind of funny. Where do you go? There's a salesman over there hovering, waiting to pounce on me, I think. <laughs> Just for reference, I can get a filter for this car for 90 bucks on FCP Euro, so it is an expensive filter. It's probably gonna, I don't know, do you think it's gonna break 200? I hope not. All right, OEM Mercedes filter, that was a success, and check this out. Here's some life advice, by the way. When you're going into a place, be nice and courteous. So the list price on it, 164, but you know what? Because he liked me, he gave it to me for 63. That is a heck of a deal right there. Okay, well, I've managed to gain access to the fuel filter. This is it right here in the middle of the engine. Just gonna undo these two hoses and remove this sensor. Okay, so new fuel filter and the old one, I just gotta switch over this sensor. Get in there. Okay, priming the fuel system. I don't remember the exact steps, but I remember it being very easy. I think I'm just gonna loosen this thing up here, which looks like it is a drain vent thing, and then I'll turn the ignition on, see if fuel comes out, and then tighten it up. I can hear fuel. Oh, there we go. All right, system bled. It's plastic, so very gentle on this. There we go, just snug. All right, let's see if it starts up. Look at that, perfect. I guess I'll report back after a little bit of driving and we'll see if that fixed the issue. So I've been driving for several hours now and I have an update. I don't think that changing the fuel filter actually fixed anything because the vehicle is still pretty sluggish to drive. Now I scanned the ECM for codes and there was an additional code there. It's a code for DPF soot accumulation, which really makes me worry that maybe the DPF, the diesel particulate filter, is full of soot. Now normally the vehicle is supposed to do a regen, a regeneration where it puts extra fuel into the system, increasing exhaust temperatures, and then it causes the DPF to heat up so much that all the soot in there burns up and it cleans it out. But it doesn't seem like that's happening. Now, I don't have any experience with this, frankly, but I assume it's a bad thing driving around with a clogged DPF. I just don't know how bad it is. My goal is to get to my hotel tonight in Amarillo, Texas, and then I'll do some research there and figure out how bad of a thing this is. The good news is I stopped and fueled up in Albuquerque, and this thing is getting 28.8 .8 miles per gallon, which is not too bad for driving 75 miles per hour in mountainous terrain with a fairly heavy SUV. The next day. All right, I think this is the DPF right here. You see up there, there's a clamp that I can undo, and theoretically, that'll allow me to test to see if this actually is the DPF that's blocked. That should relieve some of the back pressure. 
Now I'm doing this for diagnostic purposes only. I would never drive across the country with my DPF disconnected, even though that theoretically would allow me to get home. That would be highly illegal and that would just be a stupid thing to do. Look at the condition of this clamp. If this vehicle came from the Northeast, there's no way it would have come apart this easily. All right, I hope this isn't gonna to be too loud and I hope it also doesn't freak the computer out and put the vehicle into limp mode. That's not loud at all. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't have to worry about volume. I'm just worried about it being like super loud. So here's an update after my DPF test. I don't think the change I made made any difference at all. The vehicle's still sluggish, it still wants to stall when I put it in drive or reverse after starting the engine, and so I'm starting to think that there might also be an issue with the turbo. Now if that's the issue, I'm not really too concerned about it because, I mean, I can diagnose it and deal with that when I get home, frankly. I just want to get home across the country without damaging any other systems on the car. The vehicle's still drivable, even though it's slow, and I'm still getting good fuel economy, so, you know, I can live with this. Once I do get home, I can hook my Mercedes laptop up to it, it talks to all the sensors, and it does a pretty good job of diagnosing what the actual issue is. All right, good morning, folks. We are in Missouri driving to Ohio today, and let's see if it does that stalling thing that it was doing before. Put it in reverse. Yep. <laughs> Okay, foot on the gas, about 1,000 RPM, a little more, reverse. Oh, I think I got it. All right, we're good to go, didn't stall. Now I can switch feet here and we can get the heck out of here. So the irony has not escaped me that I've been talking about how reliable these vehicles are and I'm having all these issues on the way home. But that is part of buying vehicles from auctions. It's kind of to be expected that they're gonna have some issues. Well, I maintain once I work through all of the issues on this, I think it will be a very reliable vehicle. With that said, I do recommend if you're looking to buy one of these, get the ML350 with the gasoline V6 engine because that is gonna be a lot simpler and more reliable for most people. It's also a lot more common in the US. If you love diesels, then yeah, go ahead and get the diesel. I'm sure you'll be willing to put up with the potential extra issues related to the emissions system. I mean, you know, diesel engines used to be really reliable and simple and unfortunately, uh, that manufacturers have been mandated to add all of this extra stuff to them, which really does affect their reliability and simplicity, and it makes them more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. It's the next day and this is actually my last day of driving. I stayed in Ohio last night and I'm driving back to New Hampshire today. And you may have noticed that the video is not almost over and that's because I plan on diagnosing this vehicle's issues when I get home and also hopefully fixing them all in this video. So I guess we'll pick up at home unless I run into any other issues on the way. Well, I managed to limp it 2,700 miles home without any further issues, and now I'm sort of kicking myself because I've come to the realization that this whole issue may have been caused by one inexpensive and easy to replace sensor. So I scanned this code when I was in Vegas and I ignored it. The generic code is P007D, and it is the signal voltage of component charge air temperature sensor is too high. That sounds to me like it's probably a bad sensor. As it turns out, this sensor going bad can basically put the vehicle in limp mode, giving you very poor performance, and it also should prevent the DPF from doing a regeneration, which would cause it to fill up. Other codes that I have here, the fill level of the diesel particulate filter is too high, and also the soot content of the diesel particular filter is too high. I'm gonna deal with those issues today as well after I fix this sensor. Okay, the sensor should just be, oh my goodness, it's not even plugged in. Well, this is gonna be just about the easiest repair ever. All right, well, let's start it up, see how it runs and see if I can get into gear without it stalling. Okay. 
Okay, how about we go into drive? And it's still stalling. Okay, well, I still have some issues. All right, I guess I'll clear my codes and we'll see what's going on. I decided the next course of action was to clean the DPF. I'll start by removing it from the vehicle. I'm going to be using Liquamoly DPF Cleaner followed by their DPF Purge. It's a two-part system, so you're supposed to use both of them. If you look inside there, you can see this is the catalytic converter side of it. And then the other end is the DPF, and it looks much cleaner on this side. I opted to use a spray bottle to spray the solution by hand into the catalytic converter side of the DPF. After waiting 15 minutes, I sprayed the DPF purge solution in the same manner. Next, I reinstalled the DPF. So I'm trying to manually force the DPF regeneration with my scan tool here. It looks like I'm going to have to be driving in order to do it. Eventually. So I managed to force the vehicle to do a successful DPF regeneration. And the good news here is that the computer seems happy. The check engine light is now off. And third, the performance is back. So here's what I think happened to this vehicle. Somehow the sensor got unplugged. It's the charge air temperature sensor, something like that. That must have caused the check engine light to come on. And I think that the previous owner ignored the check engine light. The problem is that with that sensor unplugged, the vehicle was unable to do a DPF regeneration and the previous owner kept driving it in that condition filling up the DPF until it triggered the vehicle to go into limp mode when the vehicle detected that the DPF was full. At that point, I think the previous owner decided to trade the vehicle in rather than getting the issue fixed. Now, if the owner had gotten the issue fixed as soon as the check engine light came on, it would have cost less than an hour's worth of labor and no parts. Although really the issue probably was the last person who worked on it. Maybe they were going through that area of the vehicle and forgot to plug it back in. So it might have actually been a free fix if they caught it in time. So the takeaway from the story, if you own a modern diesel engine like this that has a DPF and your check engine light comes on, do not ignore it because this is one of the many things that can cause your vehicle to not regen even though the DPF is starting to fill up. And it'll cause your DPF to fill up to a point where your vehicle won't do a regen anymore. And then you have to clean the DPF either chemically like I did it, or you have to remove it and bring it to a company that will basically bake the DPF and blow air through it, simulating a regen. Or third, you'll have to replace your DPF, which is really, really expensive. I would kind of expect it to cost a couple thousand dollars. Unfortunately, the days of simple, reliable diesel engines are long gone and they're never coming back. So I would recommend if you're going to buy one of these, buy the gasoline engine because you won't have any of these problems and it'll just be reliable. Unless you're someone who really likes diesel engines and you're willing to put up with all of this crap, then go ahead and buy the diesel. It is a good engine. It's really just the emission stuff that they've added onto it that causes all the problems. So next up is the transmission service. This vehicle has over 200,000 miles on it, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what the fluids look like. The good news is I can tell this transmission has been serviced before. The bad news is that it was not done by a Mercedes dealership, and I can tell that based on the RTV up here. You don't need to put RTV on these gaskets. Well, this fluid looks pretty good. It's fairly red looking. New filter, made in Germany. Bad timing on that one. All right, at this point I can start it up, warm up the fluid and do the silly complex procedure that Mercedes requires. All right, it's just reaching 45 degrees Celsius. So get my drain pan ready. Well, I'm a little bit worried about that, that I didn't get enough fluid in the kit that I ordered. It was seven quarts. So I think I might order a little bit more fluid and add some more before I drive this vehicle. While I'm down here, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the front differential fluid looks like. These are the kind of things that people tend to not change. Yeah, the fluid looks like it might be a little bit old. It's kind of dark, but there's no metal in it. There's probably a magnet. 
somewhere inside of the differential itself. While I'm waiting for that differential to drain, I'm gonna try to drain the coolant here. Oh, 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 oh goodness. Well, I'm glad I'm doing a coolant flush because this coolant looks like it is mostly green when it should be blue, so I think someone added the wrong coolant. Okay, do the rear diff now. Oop. And this one, the oil looks a little bit lighter. Also no metal that I can see, so that's good news. Fill up the front and rear diffs with uh, this Redline 75W85 and it meets Mercedes-Benz 235.7 and 235.74, which are the requirements for the front and rear diffs on this vehicle. Okay, and it's full. Come on, here we go. Well, that was easy. Next, a brake fluid flush is in order. According to Mercedes, this should be done every 20,000 miles. All right, transfer case. So this vehicle, the transfer case fluid is separate from the transmission, which is different from my S-Class, which shares fluid with the transmission. Oh, wow, that's really dark and nasty looking. Well, I'm glad I'm changing it. I think it just takes half a liter of fluid. This is a good stuff, or rather it's like three times more expensive because it has the Mercedes logo on it. Gonna be here for a while. Oh, yep, that means it's full. Don't wanna forget to add coolant. So there's been a fairly substantial oil leak coming from this front corner of the engine. It looks like it's coming from the oil filter housing right where the two halves meet. That's it, it's loose. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, there we go, wow. It's, that is unbelievably brittle. I guess the brittleness, if that is a word, perhaps explains why it was leaking. Okay, so new seals here. It actually says made in USA. I don't think I've ever seen a Dorman part that wasn't made in China, but that's probably a good thing that was made in the US. It's like that. I think we're done here. So with that oil leak fixed, there was also a fuel leak that I fixed and I ordered some new idler pulleys, which I'll install at a later date. Mechanically, this vehicle, the steering, the suspension, the brakes are all in great shape. I think this vehicle is good to go and it should see some reliable service for quite a while. Oh, this headlight right here on the driver's side. I don't know if you guys noticed how yellowed and faded it was, but I did do a restoration on that and you can see how good it looks now. I have some before and after pictures. I'll put a link in the description to the kit that I use because it is very inexpensive and it does a really good job. I mean, the headlight looks brand new now. The fuel economy of this thing was very good driving across the country. I averaged 30.4 miles per gallon and obviously out west there's a lot of mountainous terrain and the speed limit is high, mostly 75 miles per hour, which high speeds kill your fuel economy. So that was really good for such a large heavy SUV. Now I estimated that I probably would have gotten about 30.6 miles per gallon if I didn't have the fuel leak. Uh, on the last day of driving, the trip computer told me I was doing better than 35 miles per gallon and on the last day the speed limit was largely 65 miles per hour which is really really good.
So my final thoughts on this, I was going into it expecting it to be kind of a cheaper, lower quality SUV, only seeing pictures of it on the internet. But I saw that these were mostly only sold with a premium one package and you know, were kind of basic because of that. And so that affected my expectations. But I have to say that it's a lot better than I expected. It is higher quality. It is nice to drive. I think it really is a very good SUV. So if you're looking for a reliable luxury SUV on a budget, Buy one of these, a 2009 to 2011 ML350. Get the gas engine or the diesel engine if you want to go that route. And with that, thanks for watching. Okay, I picked up some Mo Motul. Is that how it's pronounced? Anyone know? I've heard it pronounced Motul before. I just say Modal. Modal. Oh, well now I have conflicting, <laughs> like what the heck do I call it? <laughs> I get asked people in the comments to please let me know, how do you pronounce this? Oh, oh, oh man. <laughs> oh, I do this all the time. Okay, stop recording. <laughs>